welcome to The Upshot, Old World Disc Golf's podcast about the latest in the disc golf world. I'm the editor, Charlie Eisenhood. Joining me is Josh Mansfield. On this Thursday, March 28th, I'm in a weird hotel room in Houston getting ready for Texas States, the next stop on the Disc Golf Pro Tour and the last stop on the Texas Swing. Josh, you uh, you ready for a little Texas States action? I, I, I'm i ready as I'll ever be. I mean, four, <laughs> four weeks in a row in Texas is a long time. Uh, entire month of March, it feels like we've been in Texas for a while. So, uh, But it, it'll be a good event. I'm excited for it. Uh, before we get to our Texas States preview, we thought we would dip into our mailbag. It has been a while. We have not we haven't done a mailbag show in what feels like months. It's maybe been months. So let's get it going. We got the early season mailbag. Josh, I'll let you pick the first letter. Let's do this. And by the way, you can always send us your questions or thoughts or comments at upshot at ultiworld.com. All right. Um, you know, let's huh, I think this one's interesting. Because just a little bit we were discussing here with Texas Swing, Professor Rob says, is the one week on, one week off for a full tour a sustainable schedule? Is it lucrative enough? Does it sustain fan interest? Um, Yeah, I think so. I mean, I, if anything, I felt like the schedule was too full in the past and having a little more breathing room kind of gets you a little bit more excited about events. I mean, like, what's the alternative? Do you want to have disc golf every weekend? I don't think I do. I, that's too there much are some to people who do. <laughs> uh, no, uh, yeah, and I, I agree. In we'll, we'll cover more of this in the Texas State preview, but in Justin Westfall's preview article, he notes that there are players who, who played in the All-Star event have now played six of the past seven weeks. And others like Own and Cat Merch have played seven consecutive events. That's a ton of golf. That is so many tournaments in a row. And I, I think that the one-on, one-off is, is good because at the end of the day, people are going to continue to have lives that don't just revolve around the Disc Golf Pro Tour. And, and it can be hard to feel engaged if there's a, an event every single weekend and you don't feel like you're able to participate, engage, and follow it. So I, I think the one week on, one week off is far more sustainable. And honestly, I mean, this month, we've had an event every single weekend. Yeah. <laughs> I saw somebody on Reddit, I think, post last week, like, I'm reconsidering how I spend time on Sundays when I sat down for the FPO final round <laughs> at U.S. Women's. It just felt like it was a total slog. <laughs> and I spent like four hours watching it. Uh, you know, and the thing is, I think unless you're like a really hardcore fan who watches every mm -hmm. round – at some point you just don't you're like I, I don't want to I don't want to watch today like I'll, I'll I'll tune in for the final round or like I don't really love this event I'm just gonna go out and do something with my family and I'm not gonna pay attention to it um so I think there's like a balance and it's also a balance for the players and for the staff on the pro tour this is still Absolutely. a startup you know this is not yeah. like some giant operation where you know people just work one event and then they take you know maybe they don't work like the only thing they do is work that one event like they right. had a road team that has to go to all these events and to ask them to do week after week after week, it becomes yep. too much. And I think we saw that last year. So, uh, yeah. next, next question here. Um, this is from Johan. Has the start of the season ever been this fun? A new fantastic course at the, at the, uh, at the premier, the combo of two courses, which of course was chess.com, the combo of mm -hmm. two courses in Waco with the addition of Lake Waco, which has a lot of promise. Uh, they're going to, you know, do a big redesign next year. And then a really good complete redesign of Harvey Pennock at the Open at Austin, for sure. Can we hope for a complete redesign of Brock Park, too? Otherwise, I think the fun will take a break. <laughs> we'll that, get to that. The, the bad news is, no, there is not going to be a complete redesign. No, no big, big redesign. Uh, uh, let me answer his first question. No, I don't think the front, the beginning of the season has ever been this much fun. Uh, it, it has created, first off, I think given especially the events that are at the end of the season, MVP, GMC, Ledgestone, right? Tournaments that are storied histories, long running events on the best courses that we have to offer in US side, you know, stateside disc golf. I, I appreciate that we like don't mess with that part of the schedule, 
But this front half that is featuring new courses, getting new courses regularly, kind of changing the flow of that. I think that's been such a breath of fresh air to the beginning of this season. Combine that with the fact that Champions Cup is an early major. And man, I, I just think it it really makes for a much better Disc Golf Pro Tour season. Completely agree with Johan on this one. You know, and I, I have to say, even though I think that we're probably going to come away from this weekend feeling like the Brock Park courses are still kind of the weakest we've had for the season, there will be something, assuming the wind isn't too crazy, which it might be pretty windy, but it's going to be fun because it's going to be birdie or die. Like they tuned up the FPO course so that the holes that nobody was birdieing are attackable now. Okay. And they like moved the baskets down off the top of the mounds that were like everybody was laying up last year. So it's like going to be birdie fest and MPO. I mean, I, I, when the r- rounds weren't that windy, People were shooting 12, 13 down. I think it could be better this year. I mean, we see the level go up every year. And, you know, Heimberg shredded out here last year. AB shredded out here last year. There's a lot of low ceilings. It's not like it's it's super easy, but it's just it's very attackable. It's very flat. And it might be fun to watch kind of like a race event, which I, I don't quite know that we've had that yet. Maybe a little bit on Lake Waco. I, I mean, but mixed up with Waco, I, I don't think so. I mean, that that's the thing is... I think that it comes at a good time in the tour that it may be okay. Uh, given yeah, the first rather than events, it being right. LVC of for right. four rounds, you know, right, right, exactly, exactly. Uh, all right, I want to hit this one real quick because we actually got a ton of emails about this. This one comes from Jeff as the scoring director for the Portland Open and Beaver State Fling the last four years. Requiring players to arrive five minutes before their tea time is just common sense and courtesy. It will save me and others so much stress. Bravo, PDGA. I, I haven't really heard any negatives about this rule, but overwhelming support for people who actually run tournaments and we got a lot of mail in. So I just, I thought Jeff's was a good one. Wanted to highlight that, but please, this is Jeff and plus everyone who wrote in PDJ made a big win here on that five minute rule. Honestly, I haven't even heard the players complain. The only people I've heard complain are people online complaining on behalf of players for getting stroked, (laughs) which is ridiculous. Like, yeah, yeah. Get get over it. Like the they, they can be there five minutes early. <laughs> All right. Yeah. Um. This is a good one. This one comes from the uh, Ulti World Disc Golf Discord, which of course you can join for less than four dollars a month. Discgolf.ultiworld.com slash subscribe. Now's your chance to get in there before we do our rapid reacts on Sunday. Uh biggest. This one comes from Matt Double Z Ten. Biggest surprise outside of the top tier so far. So, like, outside the top 10, who do you feel like is a surprise or a storyline, I suppose? Not even necessarily sure. person. Sure. That's a, it's a good question. You know, maybe maybe this is a touch touch of a cop out, uh, but but I'm going to I'm going to say the names that are currently sitting on MPO between 11 to 20. Because now there's Calvin Heinberg sent to 21st because he missed an event. Isaac Robinson sent to 25th, not having missed an event. You know, Andrew Marweed, 27th, James Proctor, 28th, Simon Lazat, 31st. All those guys, James Conrad, 34th. All those guys have played full events, right? Like those are your established names. Alden Harris is down in 43rd. Kevin Jones, 47. I could go on. But in between 11 to 20, and we talked a little bit about this uh, in a show a couple weeks ago, but you got Joseph Anderson, Joey Buckets. 12, Mason Ford, 13, Aaron Gossage, 14, Matt Orm. Okay, make Joey Joey Buckets, b- pretty surprising to me, but the other three, great. And then you get Jakub Semerad at 15th, Gavin Rathbun at 16th, Matt Bell at 17, Greg Barsby at 18, Casey White at 19, and Corey Ellis at 20. Ahead of all those other guys that we talked about. Like, this season is already proving to be, I think, exciting on the second tier of those races as well. And we're seeing players come up that, and perform in ways that we just haven't seen them perform in a while for some of them or ever before for others. Yeah. And you know, the, and there's big names down the board right now, mm-hmm. you know, it's been a slow start for Simon Lazat. Yeah. Uh, you know, it's been a slow start for Ezra Aderholt guys who we've seen up at the top in the top 15, you know, obviously Macbeth, um, it's early. You don't want to go too crazy right now, but I, I do think that it's it's the, the, that that's it's notable that there's some more names popping up 
Um, and you didn't even mention, you know, Luke Humphreys, which I know he's in the top 10, but like given his past <laughs> history, it does feel like it fits the answer a little bit. Um, yeah. Outside of the top tier in FPO, I think it's a little bit harder to identify like clear storylines. I think we've seen a couple of players start to kind of be interesting. Um, you know, I whether you want to talk about Ellie Midling, obviously she comes in with a lot of hype. She's been okay so far. 14th at chess.com, mm-hmm. 21st this past weekend. Um, but otherwise, you know, you've got a lot of the same names up at the top of the leaderboard. So I think it's kind of less – I mean I, – Shout out to Haiti Lina, who reached the top 10 in the Pro Tour standings for the first time in her career. Obviously, it's very early in the season, but she had a great showing last weekend. She did. She did. And now has three top 20s and missed the first event. And back-to-back top 10s. uh, Yeah. I mean, the next seven players after her have all played three events or four events, and she's only played three, and she's ahead of them all. So Yeah. Great point. Yeah. Nice. Nice. Nice point. So. All right. What's next, Josh? Uh, yeah. <laughs> I love this question. Uh, Ida asks, what would be the most exciting thing that could happen in FPO right now? Ooh. Um, you want my – here's my crazy answer. Player okay. I'm watching this weekend, Emily Weatherman. She's going to be on the second feature card. She was at the press conference, okay? Okay. She's 17 years old. She's from Texas. She's been climbing the – she's been climbing the board a little bit with her with her rating. Okay. Um, She turns 18 tomorrow. And what would be, I think, a very interesting story – this just happens to be on my mind from my prep this week – is if she finishes inside the top 10. Is that the most okay. exciting thing to have on an FPO? Probably not, Josh. But like another <laughs> another name to pop sure. up and like be an exciting young player coming up on the scene, that would be very interesting to me. Yeah. yeah. You okay. can pick a All more right. obvious answer to actually. All right, I'll give you question. I'm gonna give you the ob- <laughs> the obvious answer. Ready? Champions Cup, playoff, Kristen and Paige. Oh my god. That's Paige, I mean but- Come on. I mean, you're not yeah, is wrong. it the chalk Is it the chalk answer? Yeah, I know it is. I know it is. <laughs> but but think about the depth that exists in the storylines if those two go to a playoff at Champions Cup. The history of them at Champions Cup. Paige making the resurgence to make it to a playoff at Champions Cup. Look, he asked for the most exciting thing to happen in FPO right now. I gave it to you. That's uh, what it a, is. A, a Paige win this weekend would be incredibly exciting. <laughs> that would too. Um, yep. Pretty much any player winning for the first time, or even just a player who hasn't won yet this season, which would keep yeah. the streak alive of new FPO winners every week. Um, you know, like I, I really think Holland Handley has a good chance to win this weekend. That I think that would be pretty interesting. That, I, the storylines yeah. are pretty rich in FPO right now because they are. There's a pool of really strong players, and like Kristen is obviously a little off of her game at the moment, which frankly makes it more interesting to not have some uncertainty going into weekends again. Yeah. It like does. will Kristen be at the top of your podium and your picks? It's not a lock. <laughs> I'm not saying you're not going to still do it. <laughs> I mean, odd, odds <laughs> tell me I should pick her again. <laughs> All right, Josh over under on when Gavin Rathbun gets a sponsor. That's from sad, sad. Yes. In the discord. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Okay. Okay. Um, let me i want to look at something real fast um i'm curious to know i my big question that i have around gavin rathbun is prior to his injury what was that 2021 when he had the pretty good season before he got injured I believe it was 21 okay he was, he was playing really well yeah okay yep 21 he's and got that two top 20s this season he's 16th in the standings yeah, it's it's looking good. Okay. Um where was Okay, we had not we had not had Champions Cup was not a thing in 2021. Isn't that crazy? How that is short crazy. of a history Champions Cup has. Uh okay. Uh, my over under, I'd put the line I, I would put the line at the 
in between give me give me the weekend after champions cup or so like uh, before the next tournament after champions cup which i think is uh portland um otb i mean sorry it would be otb not portland yeah uh, yeah so i i think in between champions cup and otb would be my line i take the over mostly because it's unclear like is he seeking sponsorship I mean, maybe it's obvious. Maybe the answer is obviously yes, but sure. He's probably done enough already for somebody to be interested, and now it's a question of on on him. You know, does sure. he want to like try to make something happen mid season? Do the do the sponsors want right. to do that? Uh, yeah, yeah. Maybe he needs to keep playing well before that could happen. I don't know. I and that's that's why I put it at the major. I think if he has a really good showing at the major lock on sponsorship if he has a bad showing at the major though uh, might might hurt his value a little bit so um all right, all right. we got a, we got a we got an old timer here with an email okay <laughs> okay hawk frequent frequent listener frequent commenter yeah he says historically he started playing in 2002 historically the two majors that mattered were worlds and usdgc if Ricky never wins USDGC, all his other majors won't matter in terms of legacy greatness. Winning Champions Cup doesn't compare to USDGC or even the European Open. The comparison is Climo and Barry Schultz. Barry won both Worlds and USDGC during Climo's run. Climo came back and won both after Barry did. Macbeth came back and won Worlds after Ricky won his two. Ricky doesn't have a Barry or a Nate Doss resume yet. He may trail or at least be tied with Feldberg. Two worlds versus one worlds and one USDGC. How do you feel about that, Josh? Ricky, Ricky hasn't won anything but the worlds. He's got the two worlds, so he hasn't won a championship. Does it? Cup. No, doesn't doesn't he have like? Doesn't he have some other oh, weird major? You know, he might have the he's, other one. He's got the weird one-off majors. You're uh, right. There was no, like I, the PDGA. Um, I forget the name of it. Yeah. Uh, bu- 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 bum. I got it. I'm going to pull it up right now. I'm also just okay. completely right. wrong. Like what I said is just totally wrong. It's just <laughs> been so long since he's won that I like forgot. But no, he won Aussie Open. Fraudulent yep, yep. major. We know that was fraudulent. Uh-huh. Uh, yep. European Masters in 2016, which is a world tour event. The 2014 <laughs> Japan Open and the PDGA Championship, which is the one I was trying to think of in 2011. She has six. See, then that's so that's this this is what Hawk is saying. Rick's got four majors here. <laughs> what he's saying is that I'm I sitting up for this one. Didn't know that he won these other ones. <laughs> yeah, or, I I did so, know so, in the back of my mind. Rick Rick's got six majors. Uh four of them are majors that have that still do not that do not happen anymore. Uh I don't know how long they happen. It, not often, as the uh, like in the consideration of majors. And several of them were in places. That were so far like removed from like central hubs of disc golf, i.e., not Europe, not the states. So the Japan and the Aussie Open, and in a time when the economic viability of disc golf was nothing what it was like today, that it was very difficult for people to get over there. And so I understand why those majors were there. Right? It, it was as in an attempt to continue to grow the sport on a global level. They created majors in these areas. That's fine, but. I agree with Hawk that I don't give Rick the kind of same credit for those majors as I do his two worlds. I do not disagree that if Rick doesn't win a USDGC, he is going to like his legacy will suffer. Uh, it's been the monkey on his back for a long time. It's we've talked about it for years uh, that, you know, USDGC just is one that continues to elude him. I, and I, I think it's one. That, oh, Continue. okay. Hold on. I'll, now, I'll, I'll say but, why I disagree. But where I disagree with Hawk, if he wins Champions Cup or European Open, those are legitimate. In this day and age, those are just as legitimate as USDGC. It will always talk about the monkey on Rick's back if he doesn't win it. But I think his legacy of greatness is cemented with another major, regardless of whichever the four it is. I think he's already established himself as one of the greats. First of all, number one, okay. because this, I mean, he's had what, at, at least three seasons in his career, maybe four, where he was clearly the best player. 
Sure. Yeah. Um, so that's one, right? Then he's got two worlds. Mm-hmm. Two. Two. Not a fluky one. Two. Yep. Where yep. back to back where he was a beast. Um, he's continued to play at a really high level for a decade. I think now, like, Hawks got to change the mental model. Champions Cup wins and European Open wins, those are going to count the same long yeah. run. Now, maybe not quite the same, right? Like, there's always tiers to everything. Sure. And I think we can all agree, Worlds is number one, USDGC is number two, European Open is three, and Champions Cup is four. Over but- time, maybe Champions Cup climbs the board because of the field strength issue. But, like, if Rick doesn't win a USDGC, but he wins – Two European Opens and a Champions Cup, like I would take that one hundred percent over him winning oh, one USDGC. Absolutely, absolutely. They, they he just are, needs to win a major. All, period. Agreed. Agreed. He needs to win a major. Uh, he there is the top tier of majors. Yes, there are an order to that tier, but those four are all on the same tier these days. Yeah. His other majors, eh, not so much. <laughs> all right, Josh. What? Okay. Uh, well, it's your it's your question. Sorry. Yeah, yeah. I, I got I got this one for you. Here you go. Uh, what players are you buying low based on their performance at the start of the twenty twenty four season? Uh, in other words, you know, stock price is low. Who who are you looking to buy while that price is low? While the while the price is in the basement. Yeah, uh, this comes from I, Zadams by the way. Isaac, in our Isaac Robinson. <laughs> yeah. I'll okay. take some Isaac That's... Robinson stock. Uh-huh. Um, is is Calvin an, a, a viable answer? I think his or, stock is lower than it was. It's lower than it was. Yeah. Um, where else? Probably Ezra Aderholt. I think he's going to pick it up. Um, an FPO, like, do I dare buy page stock? Ew. I don't know about that. That's tough. Um, uh, give me, give Haley, me Haley King. King. Stock. Yeah. Yeah. We're on the same oh, page. Yeah. <laughs> that's, that's, uh, that's a lock right there. Um, How about a little Sayananda stock before this weekend? Look, it was a <laughs> it was a big win. She beat Kristen. Uh, it's a silver event. She's she's got to back it up. Yeah, I mean, I think betting on players who are have been tremendously good as of like eight months ago, who are not playing well now, is a pretty good bet. So you could also <laughs> say Simon. You could say Eagle because people are – his stock's gone down because he's just simply not playing. Mm-hmm. Um, if you want to look for young players, like if we're talking about like a long-term fantasy draft, you know, taking a player like Ellie Mittling or like um, – what's the – Evan Scott. You know, yeah, like some yeah, of these yeah. guys who are like coming up and they're 17, 18, 19 years old, like sure. Mm-hmm. They're going to get yeah. there. All right, Josh. Um, okay. I have a comment for you. This is from my okay. own personal mailbag to you, and I want to get oh, your okay. reaction. All right. Love it. So I've just been, you know, I'm always following what's going on in the economy of disc golf, and things have been a little shaky. Uh, they've okay. been shaky for tw- probably 12 months. But, okay. you know, I came in here before the start of the new year, and I said one of my predictions for the year is that. You know, we're going to see continued growth in disc golf. Am I wrong? Right now, there's a lot of signs that the disc golf recession is still here and maybe getting a little bit worse before it gets better. Um, Just some data points for you, Josh. As of the most recent release of data, which I think was for February, uh, the PDGA memberships are down about 5% year over year. Mm -hmm. Kale LaVisca sold the preserve. Um, and that's been financially troubled for some time. Uh, the YouTube media ecosystem is what well, I mean. Look, it's a, it's decimated compared to what right. it was two years ago. Yeah, Jomez had to sell himself to the Pro Tour probably at bargain prices. Uh, Gatekeeper isn't on the road anymore, and coverage is not what it once was. Uh, you know, you look across these YouTube folks, and it, it's just there's, it's not the same. You know, Central Coast. It's not the same. Uh, yeah. In a thread about this particular topic, me- media stuff, Ian Anderson uh, said that he lost tens of thousands of dollars last year on Central Coast coverage because the cost of production 
exceeded what they were making on YouTube as views sure. have dropped. Um, we've seen a lot of consolidation in the retail space. Um, ticket sales have seemed anecdotally to me, at least a little soft. It doesn't feel like we've seen kind of like that, you know, those, remember those, the rat, like the final round at, at Waco, you know, coming out of the pandemic, it was like, holy crap, like everybody's there. Um, and you know, it's not like crowds have been terrible, but they haven't been amazing, at least how, from what we can tell on camera, um, right. stuff's not sold out for this weekend. I mean, this is all anecdote, right? Right, but, right. Um, yeah. Do you feel like this is reality that we are in a slowdown right now? <laughs> get, re- get ready for the apologist in me. Uh, n- no, I I don't actually, and and here's why. Uh, so, is it slower than the pandemic like high? Yes, but is it actually like a contraction? Absolutely not. And and here's here's why I think that's the case. When you look at the media side. In inflation and cost, like cost of production has obviously gone up. And when you're trying to square that increased cost of production against what is the media monopoly and giant of the disc golf pro tour, of course, those YouTube channels weren't long for this world. Of course they weren't. Of course, third card coverage was not going because why did people go watch third card or second card coverage in instead of watching the disc golf pro tour. Well, the reason why is because you would see people shoot hot rounds from the chase card and you wanted to go see them and you wanted to see your favorite players. You don't have to do that anymore because there's more cameras than ever. And you're able to consume and see more pros than ever before on the disc golf pro tour. And so it doesn't surprise me. And when you think about how much time it takes to watch a live tournament, it's not surprising to me that people consume less post produced of a tiers elsewhere when This elite series is consolidated. It is the tour and there is very, very high quality media coverage of it. So I'm not surprised that that, that's the case. When you think of retail side, there, (laughs) there were too many small retailers that came out of COVID that saw the demand and opportunity to sell discs. Uh, and that, that never was going to be sustainable. Uh, There are not that many small retailers of like, uh, of, of any other sport elsewhere, right? Online or otherwise. And and of course, so those that consolidation was always going to be happening. Um, and, and at the end of the day, like <laughs> maybe, maybe the reason ticket sales are down is because the Texas swing can't like Texas as a state can't accommodate four events and sell out four different tournaments week to week to week to week. Um, uh, uh, you know, that's, that's just my speculation at the end of the day, maybe, maybe it is just me rationalizing and trying to make excuses. But when I look anecdotally in, in like my disc golf sphere, uh, we have three times the many at putting league in the winter that we had before a tiers around us are still filling up and have waiting lists, 40 or 50 people long, like disc golf is still at, there are more tournament offerings now and people who are just players that are now tournament directors in the four or five states that I play disc golf in than I've ever seen before. And so maybe it isn't quite what it was at COVID, but I actually think that a sustainable wave of growth is like was built during COVID and we are going to continue to build on it moving forward. Again, anecdotes, well, but I love the optimism. I love the optimism. I think <laughs> you know, there's, there's there's an argument to be made that this is like right sizing of some of uh, these in I, any I, industries I, within the yes, bigger Yes, I think that's 100% right. Yes. For instance, YouTube, right? I could have told you five years ago when it was clear, <laughs> maybe, you know, 2020, right? It becomes sure. clear that Disc Golf Network is going to have a lot of investment, that it's a much bigger like revenue driver than anybody anticipated, and that People, you know, they were going to in, invest in making it easier to watch, more coverage, uh, better coverage, etc. I could have told you then and literally predicted this like 10 years ago almost. <laughs> yeah. That live coverage was going to slowly chip away at the post-production lead. And that's what's happened at the same time as you had too many entrants supplying the market on YouTube with yeah. lead card coverage, chase card coverage, second, third card coverage. There's not enough time in the day for all of that stuff to get consumed. Nope. So the combination of like leaving the pandemic, which means people are spending less time on the internet, right? Yep. With yep. Uh, a generalized, like, at least flattening 
of growth in the disc golf universe, along with more people watching live, means that necessarily there was going to be this slowdown in um, the YouTube world. For you know, yeah. as, as a specific example, I totally agree with you about the retailer stuff. Um, and and Walk asked, how do you square increasing tournament purses with the slowdown in the disc golf market you've observed? Because as we've seen, we do purse watch every week. Purses keep going up. Yep. And I think my answer to that is this, right? The Pro Tour is getting better at pricing, mm-hmm. both for its online DGN product and its in-person product. Um, and tournaments themselves are often the ones who are like sort of setting these purses. So they have their own investment happening. They're trying to get sponsors locally. Mm-hmm. And I think there's like the the push to try to do more than the year before. Um, and I also think that in general, the Pro Tour is probably well positioned to keep growing, even in a down market for a lot of the rest of disc golf, because I think they are going to be able to continue to try to get more people who are already in the universe, but don't follow the pro game to start following the pro game. So I think, you know, for instance, right, if we get DGN numbers at some point, I won't be surprised if it's, we're up 10% across the board for viewership. Mm -hmm. That would make sense to me. Uh, The, to answer walks question and, and like synopsis of what I was saying, like, I think the thesis here is the enthusiasm for disc golf never was going to sustain the some of the industries that had become bloated, but that doesn't mean the enthusiasm and growth isn't there. Yeah. Love it. Love love the thoughts, Charlie. Love great, great mailbag. Great, great mailbag oh, submission. Thank you, thank you. <laughs> Whoever put that one in there is a genius. Uh, uh man, that <laughs> Uh, okay. like I, like I, I probably studied economics. What do you, what, what do you got, Josh? <laughs> all right, all right. This I love this question, Ethan. Uh, we should, you know, what we should do. I want to start giving an award to our favorite question every mailbag episode, so that we can like recognize a listener. Ethan, you're getting my award this this week. All right. Hey, well, I well, love well, this mail, question. Mailbag question of the week. He gets a free. Uh, he gets a free. I don't know how many months. Three. Well, for, we're gonna say free three month subscription. Great. Ethan, we'll get, we'll get in touch with him. You're going to get a free three month subscription. Cause I think this question cuts at the very heart of my biggest problem with naming disc golf tournaments. <laughs> Ready for this? All right. With this past weekend, this is an older, older, older email, but this, with this past week's Arnold Palmer invitation on the PGA tour, I realized the ball and stick guys, <laughs> the quality, the ball and stick guys actually distinguish between an open and an invitational in disc golf. We just seem to say open or invitational or challenge or championship based mostly on what sounds the coolest. Did chess.com actually have an invitational slash restricted field? I wonder if now or in the future, you can see advantages to borrowing some of these format distinctions in the disc golf world. For example, on the PGA tour, I read that open events preserve a few spots for Monday qualifying and invitationals make grant spots to semi-retired stars. Think putting Macbeth on a feature card in his forties or amazing <laughs> stories uh, <laughs> just like just a for- <laughs> savaging Macbeth for no reason. Like. <laughs> Thinking about the future of washed up Paul. Sorry. Uh, or amazing stories like amateur or collegiate standouts. I think as the tours grows, this could be a way to bring spice and variety to the weekly grind. And I will add at the end would be a way to like cleanly identify what these tournaments are. <laughs> Thank you, Ethan. This is such a great point. Also, I swear if you have three presenting sponsors, I'm just going to boycott these events. <laughs> Champions Cup. It's for the champions and also a lot of other people. <laughs> uh, yeah. Oh my gosh. No, it's it's a hundred percent true. I you know, I think there are some variations from tournament to tournament on like who gets in. But DGPT mm-hmm. events, if you're a tour card holder, you have a spot. Right. And then they have additional spots based on various things. There's like the you know, depends on the time of year, depends on whether it's a playoff, whatever. But sure. you know, chess.com is not really an invitational in any kind of true sense. It's not like no. they sent out invitations, you know. A- it's the same inv- as any of the other things. The open at Austin. Oh. <laughs> it's the same. The invitational <laughs> to open the are the same. There's no difference. The Texas State Championships. <laughs> <laughs> like it's for the Texans Dude. and also the rest of the touring pros. <laughs> 
<laughs> and also one of four events that have equal weight. No, not even. This is the fourth event in Texas, and we've already had a major and an elite plus event. And this tournament has the audacity to call itself the championship. <laughs> top but top tier this, comment, Ethan. You know what? This one's been around though. Like this, this I, is the OG. The, the 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 disc golf pro tour should enforce naming rules that abide by certain distinctions, uh, and I'm a hundred percent here for it. <laughs> All right, last one here <laughs> before we take a break. Um, we'll come back and give you the uh, preview for Texas States. Uh, this one comes from Robert. Uh, with the March ratings update, did anybody else notice that? Own Scoggins moved into the third highest rated female player of all time. He's got the images. We'll put them up on the YouTube. Left-hand side is your current uh, top rated players. Right-hand side is your all-time top rated players. Of course, Kristen, number one at 999, just reached out in March. Uh, Paige Pierce, 996, back in March 2021, before she got sniped by the Texas Swing. Talk more about that in a, in a second, uh, and then Owen Scoggins, number three all time at nine eighty four. Uh, Missy Gannon is in fourth. Haley King is in fifth. Um, this is very interesting. Uh, mm-hmm. R- Robert said, "Note that five players reached their new highest rating in the March twenty twenty four update, which to me just goes to show you that what feels true is true, which is that the level of play is going up." Yep. Yeah. yeah. Uh- you know, uh, just to shout those players out, Kristen Tatar, Owen Scoggins, those two, obviously Haley King uh, hit her highest rating and, um, and then Holland Hanley and Ella Hansen. Like those are the other two that are hitting their peaks and, and just well, not peaks, but I guess continuing to rise and break their ceilings. So, sorry for, I, I need to make a correction. I said the left-hand side is the current highest rated players. False. This is the m- most recent highs for players. Um, and like when based on like when peak, they they hit it with their updates, when they yeah, their exactly. Ab- for when they were above nine sixty, right. So Missy Gannon re- peaked at nine eighty one on September of twenty twenty three. That is how about how about J K peaking at nine sixty eight in May two thousand and two. <laughs> Think about if she was playing in today's game at her peak. Mm-hmm. You know, you think about how competitive she is now, still on tour. At her oh age. yeah, yeah. If she was playing. In today's game, like how good would she have been? How high would her rating have been? Uh, right, her because peak performance, we always we, she was an unbelievable player. We talk about ratings inflation all the time. It's a so thing. So that's yeah, it is a thing. Abso- absolutely, absolutely. Uh, man, that would have been incredible. Uh, good stuff. All right, we're gonna take a break. When we come back, Texas State's preview and picks. Stay with us. It's the upshot. The Upshot is presented by Pound Disc Golf, makers of the best bags in the sport. Pound just dropped one of Nate Sexton's 2024 Octothorpe colorways, the Sextothorpe Earth. Check it out. You can get it right now at pounddiscgolf.com. And his second colorway, the Sextothorpe Party, is on the way. So if that's more your vibe, you got to wait a little bit, but it's coming soon. They've also got brand new Bordeaux and Sage double convertible Rufuses. I use a Rufus, love it. It's just the right size for me. Check out all the options and all the various sizes at pounddiscgolf.com. The Upshot is presented by Sunset Lake CBD, a farm that originally started as a dairy farm producing milk and cream for Ben & Jerry's ice cream, but they've since diversified and started growing hemp for CBD. You got to check their products out. This is the highest quality CBD, uh, really super nice packaging, obviously really nice quality products themselves. Uh, I've been using the like muscle rub when I have sore muscles. Feels fantastic. Smells great. Uh, Really, really nice to be able to use that instead of, you know, taking Tylenol or something like that. And you can save on Sunset Leak CBD products right now. You just got to go to sunsetlakecbd.com, use coupon code UPSHOT, and you will save 20% off your entire order. And hey, heads up, 420 sale, it's coming soon. Stay tuned. Welcome back to the UPSHOT. 
Texas States is this weekend. It'll be played at Brock Park on two separate courses on the same property. Not not so frequently seen on the Pro Tour. Maybe the only place that I know of that does this. Um, completely separate courses. It's it's the Brock Park Premier for the MPO and the Diamond for the FPO. Um, obviously, we have plenty of different layouts for the same course or approximately the same course, but here it's completely separate 18 hole courses. Um, they basically rework the existing course at Brock Park, Josh, to be mm-hmm. the FPO layout with some change T pads and OB and such. Uh, and then they put in a temp course, which might become permanent or semi permanent, at least with T pads in the future. Uh, given that uh, I was talking to the TD. Chris Vandergriff, and he mentioned that the uh, Houston Parks and Rec Department was really impressed with how this event went last year, has made it a lot easier to get things done, has kind of like removed some of the red tape. And that's been part of the reason that this event has been elevated from silver to elite, which we basically don't see uh, from like every silver event that got silver status, like went away right? pretty mm-hmm. much. Yeah. Um, besides like Beaver State Fling, which was a legacy NT. And I guess Texas States was too, uh, but I think it's just notable that this one got the bump. Uh, you know, Charlie, there is one other event that offers the how how should I put it the the wonderful effort and and just great decision to host two separate courses for the divisions. Do you know what event that is, Charlie? I, I don't. It's Ledgestone. Oh, oh, oh the okay, FPO okay. play Sunset Hills. Yes, I, <laughs> thank you. I understand what, what, that, but that's not on the same property. Oh, on the same property. Okay, I see what you're saying. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, my bad, my bad. Get get out of here with this alleged stone <laughs> stuff. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. So, uh, you know, we we talked about the email from uh, Johan earlier. Uh, talked about the kind of the redesign in terms of like distances. Uh, just nuts and bolts. What we're talking about, Brock Park. Uh, honestly, pretty comparable. Uh, last year, 2023 distance was 9,800 feet. This year, 10,001 foot. Uh, same par, par 63 on the MPO side. Uh, over on the FPO side, uh, was 7,700 7, uh, 7, feet. Now, 7,600 feet. Just lost about 100 feet. Still par 63. So, uh, pretty comparable in terms of distances and pars. Charlie, as you've talked about, they've lowered some of them off of the hills, making those a little bit easier on the approach. Uh, but largely retains i think the characteristics and nature of the course Definitely. as it was from previous years yeah they tightened up some ob they moved some t-pads a little bit like things are going to be polished but it's not like it's mm-hmm. they didn't like rebuild holes for wholesale right uh except right. a couple of they moved a t-pad of you know 75 feet on a hole for fpo that was just playing too hard um but yeah i mean you know if you watch the coverage last year it's going to look very familiar um, you know it's coming. Sayananda and Calvin Heimberg won this last year as a silver event. Sai beating Kristen. Um, yes. That was not a full field, but Kristen was there, and it was, she was but- widely expected to dominate. And then Sai <laughs> just played amazing. Um, and Calvin, Calvin was awesome. He beat Anthony Brella by six strokes, I think. Shot, yeah, shot his highest rated event rating of the year last year, a 1072 event rating. Uh, just a, a sparkling tournament for Calvin last year. What's his best ever event rating? It might've been that he shot 1073 that, at the Memorial in 2020. And then last year, count. uh, 1090 all-star weekend. Obviously that's just nonsense. Uh, doesn't 1073 yeah. Innova open Texas States. So, all right. I think arguably the best tournament he's ever played. Yep. Yep. Uh, I just refuse to include Memorial on that list. Yeah, yeah, I, as you should. As you should. I, I refuse. I refuse to. I refuse Subtract to ever say somebody's performance ratings points. Yeah. Yep. Yep. So yeah, c- <laughs> congratulations, Calvin. Uh, last year you shot your best tournament ever here. <laughs> um, Here's the problem for Calvin, though, Josh. Okay. All right. Tell me what the problem is. Rick's in the field. Okay. Ricky has played this. Why is that a problem? Times, and he's okay. won it every single time. Four times as an elite series, two times as an A tier. This will be his seventh time playing it, and he's literally never lost. Look, <laughs> <laughs> that's tough because when Rick plays well at an event, 
Rick plays well in an event. Uh, it's like picking against Rick at Ledgestone. It's oh, just my. a... <laughs> Look, that wasn't even intentional. You know I'm I right, know. though. Rick's great right. at Ledgestone. You're right. You're right. <laughs> Man, what a uh, welcome to the uh, Texas State's preview, uh, sponsored by Ledgestone Open. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you know, and that's look, Rick. That that is a statistic that would make me very nervous if I was Calvin Heimberg. Uh, I, especially given that he is injured and not quite in the same form that he was last season. It's a big question mark to me as to what Calvin's going to look like this weekend and if the repeat's possible. I'm excited to see Rick here as this an elite back in the elite series. Uh, it's it's going to be it's going to be tough to beat Rick when he plays well at a course. The one thing is, of course, he didn't play this event last year, Ricky, and so right. he has not played this course on tour. So was it not Brock Park in 2021? I don't think so. Or 2022, I, was, I meant. I don't okay. even think it was in Houston in 2022, uh, because this this event moves around. I'm You're pretty right. sure Brock yeah. debuted and like they basically like pulled the course together. Remember last year? Because it was uh-huh. like, uh-huh. what what are they playing in Texas States? And it was like, oh, this like random new course that nobody knew I about. Think, yeah, 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 yeah. Um, where did they play? I'm pulling up. Ty- it was in Tyler, Texas, and it was at the Thorn. That's the right, Thorn. The thorn. Yeah. 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 Um, and what was, did the thorn like flood or something? I don't know thing? what the deal is. I'm, I think I this, the, I wonder if this event will continue moving around probably within Houston. You know, is like the new Maybe. Nico course going to end up being on the tour. Could this become a four day elite plus? I don't know. It'll be interesting. Maybe. Like the Maybe. battle between this and, Austin and Waco for like supremacy as the best tournament in Texas. Like that's got to be a real thing that they're going to be thinking about. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, you could, you could make something out of that. You really could like award, like a little mini award between just like the TDs for performance at you your know Texas what, tournaments. You know what they should do? They yeah, should I'm, have I'm, mini I'm awards for players for like winning the Texas swing. Yeah, that's Yes. And then, like, winning the West Coast wing. Sure. And winning the, you know, and the East Coast Cup or whatever. And then the Southeast Love Invitational. That. Stop that. <laughs> <laughs> no, I love that idea, though. And, and and if you did, because it's just a way to invest in and give a give a $5,000 bonus. Give a bonus. And and call call sponsors in Texas and just say, we, we need ten grand for the winners of the Texas swing. Five each. For MPO, FPO, for winners of the Texas Swing, and it would be the Texas Swing powered by Ford, sponsored by <laughs> Motorola. <laughs> uh, yeah, no, I love that idea. I, and I think I think especially for Texas, like West Coast Swing, I think is also a natural fit. Uh, you know, if you said like the Midwest Swing, like it feels a little odd there, but especially the Texas Swing with three events, it's clean, it's concise, it's easy to follow, it's within a four-week time period. It might make me a little more invested in staying in Texas. Yeah, so. you you would have something else to pay attention to this weekend yes. besides just the top of the leaderboard. To so be mm-hmm. like, well, if so and so finishes at least fifth, they're going to guarantee themselves the victory. But if so and so other person beats them, then you know they're going to love lose that their Texas swing, you know, cattle prod or whatever they would win. <laughs> <laughs> Um, <laughs> all right. you, no, no, no. It's got, it's got to be an ensemble. You have to get boots from one tournament, a belt yeah. buckle from another, and a hat from a third, and then you get, and then you get your cattle prod for if you win the whole thing. <laughs> so you can have the full ensemble. <laughs> Ready to, to oh be, my gosh. go onto the set of a Western movie. Um, <laughs> I'm watching the movie Tombstone right now. I say I'm watching it because my wife keeps falling asleep like 20 minutes into the <laughs> Like so, I'm like we've watched like half of the movie. Pretty good one from the '90s. <laughs> good, good movie. Val, really good movie. Val yeah, yeah. Kilmer. Uh huh. Playing. Yeah. A, I'm a big fan. Yeah. Okay. You know it. Good. Yeah. Um, oh yeah. 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 All right, Kristen. As we know, 9.99 rated. Mm-hmm. Um, did not play her best this past weekend and is now averaging since the last update 9.91 and a half. Okay, so. Uh, that's through seven rounds. 
if she's going to get to a thousand rated, she needs to average basically a thousand from the last mm-hmm. update to the next update, which will include this tournament. And if she plays it, an A tier next weekend, Persimmon Ridge. Okay. Um, if she doesn't play that A tier, here's what she's got to do this weekend. Okay. I did the math. She needs to average 1020 if she wants to average 1,000 across these 10 events. Oof. <laughs> that's, that's a lot. Um, that's a lot. What? And you did the math based on what's dropping off as well? I I haven't gone that deep, but okay. I know that she needs to average right around 1,000. So I just said, right, okay, right. give me the raw average of these 10 events to get to 1,000 okay. of these 10 events. What does she need to do in these next three, given that she's averaging 991? And it's 1020. Because so here's I, I, I don't you might be right. And I, I don't want to challenge it too hard here. One thing of note <laughs> from last <laughs> but <laughs> but I'm about here's to challenge why you're it. wrong. <laughs> um it's just a it's so it's interesting because these rounds are worth twenty five percent more, or like they're double weighted because they're in the most twenty five most recent rounds. Yes. So that they're worth double the that, weight. That, that's all she, included in this basic calculation. Okay. Okay. So the one nice thing she has going for her, she will be dropping six, seven sub thousand rated rounds, including a nine forty five and a nine fifty one. So and she's only losing already all been accounted for. That's all included. Math of saying she needs to average a thousand in this month. Okay. All right. I'm going to trust you on that then. I mean, um, plus or minus a little bit here, but it's, it's sure. quite clear that she's going to have to shoot amazing this weekend, or at least over the next two weekends, she'd probably have to average about 10-10 in order to get yeah. back up to that thousand level. It's it, She may have also been sunk by the Texas Swing, just like Paige you know, three years ago. You know what, Charlie? I think the Texas Swing, the little Texas Swing series, it just needs to be re- renamed like the thousand rated killer. <laughs> and uh because that's you're right like Kristen Kristen was so close and it feels like Texas did her in watch Kristen come out and just go absolutely ballistic this weekend and shoot <laughs> break zones record five yeah <laughs> yeah it's yeah, not impossible cool. it's, uh, it's not absolutely impossible. Not. especially with the OB <laughs> and stuff um yeah all right Josh I think probably time to get to our picks here all right, let's start over on the FPO side. Third place, I'm riding Valerie Mondahano to another point. Uh, <laughs> she delivered for me. We're still in Texas, and while we're in Texas, I'm going to keep picking Mondahano. Uh, she looked good. She looked good. And and while this isn't, I think the same. It's it's not the same style, of course. It's still is going to give her an opportunity to show what is one of the best and most well rounded games in all of FPO disc golf. Give me Valerie Montehano in third. Second place, Hall and Hanley. She played well here last year. Uh, <clears throat> she was in fourth place. And Holland is just, she's feeling like while there are struggles, the ceiling of her game continues to elevate to a point that I think she's a threat to win week in and week out. And I just, I'm, I'm nervous about anytime I leave Holland off right now, I just, I feel a little nervous. I think she's going to succeed here. But my number one pick, I did it all last year, and I'm going to keep doing it until she gives me a reason not to. Kristen Tatar. Look, Kristen's off weekend is still just better than most players' ceilings. And yes, there have been some spectacular tournaments. But it, if it if it's going to take other players to shoot record-breaking performances to take down wins over Kristen... Uh, I'm just I'm just gonna keep riding those points, and I think Kristen's gonna want that thousand rated bad enough that she's gonna blow everybody out of the water here. Wow, I, I can't I, I just can't I can't, I can't do it. I, I'm gonna put Kristen on my podium because I respect the level of play that she can bring, even on a B or a C level mm-hmm. weekend for her. But her back hurts. Her she got a picture on the Instagram of her ankle completely swollen up. Now I know those ant bites. I'm sure it's fine now, <laughs> but like. There's too many things that are like a problem right now for me to feel like Kristen's all of a sudden going to just be like, boom, I'm back. I'm rocking your world. Now, to be mm-hmm. fair, she's done that before. So it could uh, happen. You know, 
listen, and, and I think it happens every time you don't pick Kristen. So uh, I appreciate that you're not putting her at the top. <laughs> I have Kristen in my three spot, as I mentioned. Uh, I'm going to put Own Skog into my two spot. I think this is just like a very, uh, very own friendly course. It's like low okay. ceilings and like putting is, gonna, is a bigger challenge than on many courses. There's like a lot of water danger towards the end of the back nine. Um, and, you know, she talked in the press conference about being concerned about the wind, but like her putting in the wind is still like really, really good, better than everybody else's putting. Just like everybody's putting level goes down. So I think Own uh, will be right there. But my number one pick is Evelina Salonen. I'm calling for the bounce back. I thought Evelina looked fantastic last weekend. And sure, she had some putting issues, but I think she's just going to she's going to tear this course apart. That's that's my expectation. This is it's a very go watch the YouTube uh, drone flyovers that the Pro Tour posted. This is such an attackable course. We didn't see a lot of the top players play this tournament last year, so. We haven't really seen it like totally ripped to shreds, but I'm telling you, it's not it's not very long. I mean, wh- what did you say the length was, Josh? S- 7,600 feet? S- yeah, something like that. Yeah, it wasn't, well, not and much. It's not a wooded course, and it's flat. 76. It, it, this yeah. is like th- – th- it is an ultra-attackable course. There are going to be a lot of birdies. I think we're going to see double-digit under par rounds unless the wind is up big in the mornings, which is possible. Um and so I just love Evelina's chances because I think she's going to be able to just like park baskets constantly because it's like she'll be able to she'll disc down to a putter and just right. park everything. So uh, that's what I'm going for on FPO. On the MPO side, I'm taking Gannon Burr in my three spot. Gannon's almost an auto include right now for me on podiums. Um, I've got Calvin Heimberg in the two spot. I think he's going to play great again. He said that he feels like he can totally attack this course with a backhand. And that his he's not throwing the forehand again. He said that um, as he continues to deal with what he believes is tendonitis. But I I've seen a reason to think that he can't play great, especially because his putting was so good last weekend. But in the number one spot, not because I don't think Calvin's going to play well. I just think he's dialed to rock this course, and that's Anthony Barella, who I think is going to get another win. You're taking chess chess.com invitational repeats. Run it back. Okay. I like it. In my three spot, I'm going with Cole Radolin. Uh Cole played really well open in Austin. Why are you laughing at me? I don't know. You what? just love picking Cole Radolin. I, mean, I like do you love picking Cole Radolin. too. No, there was U.S. Women's last week. I didn't oh, pick any MPO players ago. last two weeks week. Ago. I did pick him in open in Austin, and he was in sixth. He almost got in there. Uh, he was all of two strokes away from being on my podium. Okay. Um, so... That's exactly why I'm picking him again. Uh, in fact, he was only one stroke behind your Gannon Burr, who's your third place. So he's a, he's another player who I think when given the opportunity and really like it gets a course where he can light up and get rolling, he's going to do so. Yeah, and he could shoot a 1600 out here, sure. And that's why, much like my second place player, Anthony Barella, I think they both have the opportunity to do that. I love your first place pick. I've got him in second. Uh, I really think both of Cole and Anthony can get just on a hot streak where they're just birdieing everything and get in a really, really exciting tournament. Thanks to both of them. But give me the Finn to win twice in Texas. Nicholas Antela goes in my number one spot. Nicholas played really well here last year. Um, you know, not not Calvin levels, but he finished sixth and and played well. I I think it's indisputable that Calvin is pl- or that Nicholas is playing at a higher level than he's ever played before. He's got the win, he's got the confidence. He's still in Texas, and I really think that he's going to continue to shine. Give me Nicholas to give, get a second win before he leaves Texas back to back. We're all we're picking repeats, even though we've had <laughs> no repeats yet. That's true. No repeat winners yet on tour. No repeats. We're saying the, it, this weekend bucks the trend. What would the what's the over under on repeat winners this weekend? Is it half oh, or geez. is it one and a half? Oh, it's it's got to be it's got to for repeats. Yes. If I don't care whatever number you give me, I'm taking the under. Oh, There's really? Too many good players. Wow. Oh, yeah. But like in both divisions, mm, a lot of the, the good players the have odds, won now. Did you wait? Wait, hold on. Did you just say all the good players have won? 
Well, no, but like many of the of strongest players have now won an event. Like I mean, own, own Missy and Kristen have all now won, and Evelina in FPO, and those have probably been the four best players so far this season. You're right. So, so it, uh, honestly, you might be right on the one and a half. FPO does get nerve a little bit nerve wracking, but on the on the flip side, I also get to have Holland and Ella and Valerie and I mean players. Oh, sorry, Ella's not playing. Okay, this might be a little tougher than you said. You might you might be a little more right. All right, all right. Was, you took you you already locked it in. You took the over. You took the under on any number I said. So I, I, number is a one zero point five, and we'll. See I, I may have been a little hasty here. <laughs> I I may have been hasty. Um, yep, fair fair. I deserve this. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Well, so neither of us take Ricky. Uh, to repeat, so we have both have him. Now we don't even have a podium. It's, it's, it's disrespectful. It is disrespectful. <laughs> I don't know how I feel about it now that I actually am thinking about it more. But I don't know. I think he's probably going to be top five. I just it's you know. this is not the same. It's so hard. When, when I realize that this is not the course that Ricky has won on, like, well, that's the thing. It, he's just, won all over the place. I hear you, but this this course, like when you think about the Thorn and other events, they have been more. I don't know. I think I think this course was more open than that, and so I just I just am going to pick throwers. Okay, I like the Nicholas call. Uh, I, I think it's like not too long of a course for him to be competitive. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. He that's, said that's for the hope. He said today. I, this is another little nugget. I, I didn't clip the press conference because I didn't have time. But um, how do, how far do you think? Nicholas can throw. I got max I distance can, backhand in a, on a in a tournament. Max distance backhand in a tournament. I would mm-hmm. say five fifty, five twenty five, four fifty. That's what he said. Really? Yeah. He said four ninety on a good day, like on a golf line, like, but like, like in a tournament, okay. four fifty. He's throwing four fifty. He's not the furthest thrower. No. Pretty I, 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 think, think, I think you could be competitive with that level of distance on this course, even though I think it so is too. like very, it's not totally open. There's trees, there's obstacles. Sure. Low ceilings is probably the most prominent thing, which is why I think Calvin it has such an advantage. I think, I think you're totally wrong not to have Calvin on your podium, by the way. Um, but you're, known, you're a known known right Calvin now. hater. You're a known Calvin hater. I, so we all I am a this. known Calvin hater. And you know what? <laughs> I've won a lot of bets on Calvin and on Calvin hating. So <laughs> all <laughs> the, right. the, well, the tide of the populace swayed with me by the end of the season last year. That's true. Wow. The people really turned against Calvin when it, it's, been, it's coming up on a calendar year since he's won an event. Mm-hmm. If he but, doesn't win here, it, he's got Jonesboro left, right? Yeah. Yeah. He won. Remember, he won LVC this event. And Jonesboro, and yep. and was playing unbelievably, and then I mean he obviously still played amazing the rest of the season, but he did not win again, Mm-mm. and he has not won this season yet. So we'll despite having a lead at a major in the final <laughs> round, <laughs> two down through seven. Such Charlie. a hater, such a <laughs> hater. All right, we're going to be back on Sunday night in the Discord live to break down all things Texas States. So get yourself a subscription and join us there. Uh, It's a lot of fun, and uh, then we'll be back with you next week on Tuesday. Thanks so much for tuning in to The Upshot. For Josh Mansfield, I'm Charlie Eisenhood saying so long. We'll see you then.